afternoon, everyone, uh, in my capacity as chair of the Committee uh, for the Environment. I would like uh, to welcome you all uh, to today's seminar. Good to see so many people here. Uh, this seminar, which focuses on RPA and community planning, is particularly timely, given that one aspect of RPA is the reform of local government for which the Environment Committee is currently considering the Local Government Bill. The bill provides the legislative basis required to reform the future operation of councils, the delivery of council functions and the promotion of communities in shaping the area through the introduction of community planning. The review process began back in 2002, before I came into Stormont, and the committee very much welcomes uh, the piece of legislation in providing the final preparations for the transfer of functions from central government to the new 11 councils in April 2015. The bill was formally introduced to the Northern Ireland Assembly on the 23rd of September 2013 and is now with the Environment Committee for consideration. The committee is currently at the stage of gathering evidence where interested parties and stakeholders were invited to submit their views on the bill to the committee by the 22nd of November. In fact, we've got quite a good uh, response from stakeholders. We got, I think, altogether 34 uh, submissions. In fact, this morning, the committee held a stakeholder event where uh, participants were given the opportunity to directly engage with committee members and offer suggestions on the bill. It was a very well attended meeting and we were delighted uh, by the input from uh, various uh, councils, uh, stakeholders, the voluntary sector as well. So it was a very constructive meeting. Uh, I think some, some of the attendees from this morning's uh, stakeholder event uh, are also here for this part uh, of the day too. Um, however, along with stakeholder views, the committee relies on evidence to help inform its decisions. Therefore, we are always interested to hear what research is telling us and how we can learn from examples elsewhere to help assist our work. With this in mind, I look forward to introducing both presentations today which clearly uh, complement the current work of the committee. I would like to welcome all three speakers, Dr. Maurice uh, McCarthy from the School of Politics, International Studies and Philosophy at Queen's University Belfast in my constituency. <laughs> Prop plug. <laughs> and Professor Greg Lloyd, and Gavin Rafferty from the School of the Built Environment at the University of Ulster. Uh, Dr. McCarthy will begin proceedings by taking us uh, through his work on RPA, uh, illustrating lessons to be learned uh, from other countries uh, with respect to public service reform. This will be followed by Professor Gregg and Mr. Rafferty, both of whom whom uh, will look more specifically at community planning, in particular highlighting the importance of its interrelated links with spatial planning in promoting effective and efficient surface delivery. Professor Lloyd is in fact no stranger to us, as on a number of occasions he has given evidence to the committee, particularly during uh, his consideration of the really long planning bill uh, in, in 2011. So uh, Dr. McCarthy, Professor Lloyd and Mr. Rafferty, you're all very welcome here today and we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you to, to Eileen and to Susie and colleagues for um, affording me the opportunity to come here today. This is a great uh, series, the, the CAS series, 
Um, I'm a relatively new member of staff in Queen, so when I found out about this, I thought it was a fantastic idea and put forward a proposal, and I'm delighted it was accepted. Um, I'm, by way of background to this, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on the review of public administration. I'm well aware of it. Um, I would defer to Professors uh, Knox and Beryl here at the front uh, about the, the detail of it. Really, what I wanted to, to, to speak to um, is some research I've been doing in my previous uh, role. I worked in the Institute of Public Administration in Dublin, which is kind of like the public service training college in the Republic. Uh, and there I was involved in a lot of applied and uh, commissioned research um, on issues on, on public sector reform. Um, so I have some, some idea the RPA about the RPA um, it tends to be conceived as specifically about local government reform, but of course the original idea is much more ambitious than that. Um, but what I hope to present to you is, is just some information about what's going on and in public service reforms internationally in the context of the global uh, financial crisis or the Great Recession, because it has ushered in a, a new period of reform and governments are responding in different ways, sometimes desperate measures, sometimes more planned measures. In some cases, the crisis has been very nicely, you know, has been used to accelerate pre-existing reforms. So what I wanted to present to you is just some information about what's going on and perhaps it'll lead nice. so in fact telling you a little bit about a lot of things and hopefully lead nicely into the subsequent presentation which is obviously more, more focused on the um, community development and local government sector. Um, so I have a presentation which you understand you'll be given, I have an accompanying paper and of course we'll have questions at the end. Um, so by, yeah, I, I mean, one of the first reviews I, I, I read uh, done by the OECD in, in 2010, it did a quick trawl of governments like in, you know, after 2008, how, how, are, how are national governments responding to the crisis? And the sort of stock in trade responses were, well, a two to one, this idea of two, two cut spending for one increase in taxation, um, you know, a move to online services, uh, which, which resonates with the new Minister for Finance here's idea about, uh, you know, that this would be a priority of his public service reform initiatives. Um, restoring public trust in government, uh, which has been severely affected. And of course then a structural reform, so reforms of the public organizations. And I'm going to speak um, to, to some of these, and I'll tell you which ones uh, in a second. But a more recent uh, study, and possibly more accurate, I hope you can read this now, um, has been conducted by some colleagues, which I sort of have an involvement in this project. Um, it's a survey of 5,000 public service managers in 10 states. And they asked them, you know, what, what are the big reforms going on in your a particular area at the moment? So this is a very, very good um, sample of what's happening uh, around Europe right now in terms of public sector reform issues. And I draw it, the, the red line is the kind of the overall average, the range is between one and seven, as you can see. And the, these three here are the big ones. Uh, it increased, I mean, this isn't new, the move towards e-government has been around since the 1990s, but a specific emphasis on the digitization of services and pushing things more and more to online, you know, pushing the, the responsibility almost onto the citizen to engage with, with government uh, directly through online services. Uh, collaboration and cooperation amongst different public sector actors. This is a huge area. Uh, in effect, to simplify things, I mean, prior to 2008, there was a general global trend towards fragmentation of the policy cycle, but also of uh, fragmentation of government services, lots of different organizations. What we see now is very rapid, sometimes incoherent, sometimes well-planned, uh, drawing in together of government, a sort of contraction or retrenchment of government. Uh, and also an interesting one here, this um, yep, uh, transparency and open government uh, again, the idea of putting more information out in the public domain, which has been legislated for in, in some states, as we'll see. And there's lots of other ones there, which, you know, public sector downsizing, the performance issue, which I'll come back to in a second, the whole issue of rethinking what we mean by good performance in the public service. What is good performance? How do we, how do we measure it in the public service? Uh, reducing red tape and so on. And down, as we move down, these, these are the different responses. The ones that are least likely, to, you're least likely to see happening around Europe at the moment are privatization, which when you think about it is interesting because the last time we had a big crisis, this was one of the primary responses was privatizing public services, but it's been very slow. Governments have been very slow to do this, to sell off state assets. Instead, we think about new ways of delivering public services, but not quite privatization. And also here, the, the creation of autonomous agencies or corporatization. So less, uh, I won't say less quangos per se, but less propensity to think, well, there is a problem, let's set up a, a specific organization to tackle that problem. And, you know, it might solve the problem, it, mi it might not. So we can see a whole range of different responses, but these are the, 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 the kind of, uh, as I said in the previous slide, the primary ones, and then the, the sorry, least likely ones to see um, happening. So 
there's lots going on. What I've chosen to, to speak about, and I'll just say a few words very briefly on them, is, is just on four issues. First of all, I want to look at the issue of uh, performance, as I said. Secondly, just to talk a little bit about digitization and, and open government. Uh, thirdly, to talk about the rediscovery, uh, if I can say it, of, of public service motivation, why people work or want to work in the public service. And finally, the issue of the structural reforms, the reorganization or the re-reorganization of government, because governments are constantly being, being reorganized, uh, as it were. Okay, so to go to the first issue, and as I say, I've written up a little bit more about, and th these are very big topics and I have very little time to go into them, so it's just really to give you a flavor of some recent developments. Um, here again is another chart. Sorry, I should have said I'm taking this, this um, data from the, the COCOPS project, which is the um, uh, Coordination for Cohesion in the Public Service of the Future. Don't ask me where they come up with these, these names at this project. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's from senior public service managers being asked, like, what are you doing? Like, what, what, are, what, are, what do you perceive to be the big changes or what do you feel are the political pressures to change in your work and what, what are you doing about it? Um, and we see here that there's, again, the scale is on, on one to seven. What's interesting is that these aren't, these aren't runaway successes, okay? There's the average line there is four for, uh, for all the responses. But, you know, creeping up towards five, it's, it's moderate that in terms of the effects of the reforms over the last five years, what public service managers, senior people from ministries and agencies around Europe are saying, yes, there's been some improvement in, in costs and efficiencies and also in around service quality. And these are the big indicators of good performance, okay? Are things being delivered cheaper or are you delivering more for the same price and so on? Um, where there are big problems, though, and these, you could argue, that this is where reform should be focused, um, is on staff motivation, big dips in morale. And I hear about this all the time, you know, there's been very little recruitment into public service, people have been asked to do more, we've got pay cuts and so on. Um, staff motivation, the attractiveness of the public sector as an employer. Now, of course, terms and conditions apply to this. In some contexts, it's extremely attractive where the private sector is hemorrhaging employment. Um, social cohesion and, and citizen trust this is very, been quite clearly damaged, and it's not quite clear how it's to be resolved, although there is some relationship between better performance, demonstrable good performance by government does increase public uh, trust in government. That's one thing we can be sure of. Um, so uh, this chart here talks about, well, what are the ways in which um, the, the sort of reforms are being implemented? You won't be surprised. Uh, in most countries, there are some form of a, a hiring freeze. Uh, in effect, people aren't being recruited. Although what's interesting here is the squeeze of demographics. So a couple of years in, nobody's recruited. Young people aren't being recruited into the public service. People are retiring at the other end, the natural wastage term, but also there's incentivized schemes. So people in 60-year-olds uh, and onwards uh, retiring out of the public service. So you have uh, storing up particular issues there in terms of the demographic of, of public services uh, around Europe. So hiring freeze there. But these are the main ways. And it, you, I sort of try to conceive of it. It's almost like slowing down a train because what you tend to see is uh, the huge increases in spending on, on social welfare health and education, and these have been sort of gradually slowed down and now perhaps beginning to, to reverse in effect. So you see uh, new ideas or new programs being cut, um, existing programs. Um, I mean, the choices for government are these, you know, this idea of uh, the terms you use, salami slicing, so everything gets cut by 5% or else you target your cuts. And I think we've moved from the salami slicing, you know, leaving it up to local managers, you find the 5%, just give me a 5% cut, I don't care how you do it. Now it's like, well, that program's not going ahead anymore. We just can't do that. So we see genuine state retreat or retrenchment or quite simply exit from policy areas. I mean, Greece is just uh, unbelievable. I mean, just, just stepping away from, right, we're not, we can't actually do child immunizations anymore. Really horrific stories coming out of uh, the Greek pub public service. Um, so, and, and of course, the downsizing of back office functions. And this is one area which I'm quite interested in the idea of shared services, and I understand in Northern Ireland there are some long-established shared service centres here, uh, but this idea of emerging back office functions and trying to protect the front line. Um, but again, I, I, I wonder sometimes about this back office front line distinction. That is, it's, you know, I do think back office changes do affect front line services in, in more ways than is possibly recognised. And then the least likely things to happen here are staff layoffs, uh, pay cuts, uh, and then you see these creeping in here then. Um, the frontline stuff does at some stage, I think, will come into focus, particularly as the austerity measures work out. And this is the new normal, as we keep being told. Cuts are going to keep, keep coming. OK, so that's just a little bit, as I say, it's, it's telling you a little bit about a lot of issues about performance and the work of the public service um, around Europe. If we look here at, um, and this is, uh, sorry, I think it was from the, no, we see the recent publication. I think it's the new edition of Government at a Glance. 
which is always a bit disappointing when it comes out. Um, and this is about the digitization. And it's very much in the context of the EU, the Horizon 2020 agenda of trying to get citizens to engage more um, with government by means of, of online services and to apply for things and to provide information and to get information um, without actually speaking to somebody, uh, in effect. Uh, and of course, when the e-government revolution was meant to transform democracy, it didn't really deliver on that. What it has been very good at is, is transforming the automation of back office functions, um, but also now, or what we see now is more and more emphasis, as I said at the start, on, on online delivery of services. And the e-government action plan the EU has set out, which all member states are obliged to fulfil, is very ambitious targets by 2015 and again by 2020 in terms of, like I think it's like 80% of um, service, or no, I'm going to get the figures wrong, but they're very high in terms of the, the, the range of public services that are to be available online and the uh, percentage of citizens interacting. Um, you won't be too surprised there, the Scandinavian and Nordic countries have very high levels of uh, communication, uh, or heavy high levels yeah, of uh, communication between government and citizens. Um, the United Kingdom, sorry, when I try and throw this over the kingdom, it got chopped off there. Um, I presume I find it very difficult, and it's something I might say at the end, I find it very difficult, and maybe I'm not looking in the right place, to get good quality information on what's going on in Northern Ireland in respect to this stuff. So you're somehow wrapped up there, and I, I don't know what the exact figure is in, in the UK figures there. Um, so clearly, quite a way to go there. Um, but again, the, the new minister um, from I've seen, seen him speak about this wants to move uh, more in this uh, direction. So it's not uncommon, but clearly there are countries that are, that are leaps and bounds ahead, particularly Denmark. You know, it's, uh, Denmark's everything is there. Estonia's in, I've been in Estonia quite a few times recently, well, a couple of times recently. Um, the internet there is seen as a human right. You get it everywhere. You know, it's it's freely available, and they really are very keen for citizens to exclusively interact with government um, in, um, in with public services. Public service pay has been cut. You might be intrigued to know who has increased public service pay at this time: Finland and Slovakia. Yes, Finland and Slovakia have increased pay. Um, but by and large, what we're seeing is uh, the tier. Sorry, the reason I'm, I'm moving to this is I want to talk now moving away from digitization issues towards a, another important issue, I think, of public service motivation, which I mentioned uh, previously. And in the, con the primary reason people work anywhere, not just the public service, is, of course, remuneration, terms and conditions of service. These are being hit all the time. So you've the, the headline cuts in pay, cuts in rates of pay, changes to pension entitlements, changes to leave entitlements, changes to all different terms and conditions happening everywhere. So very few countries have been affected by this. And it raises the whole question, well, what, what, how can you motivate people to keep giving in the public service when they're being asked to do more for less, uh, when the tasks are never ending, when people are leaving? Uh, what do you do? It? And the reason I put this up is because there's kind of a reigniting of interest in this in the academic community about thinking about why people want to work in the public service in terms of altruistic reasons, that some people want to contribute to society. Some people like being around the corridors of power. They like engaging with politicians and so on. They want to make a difference. But there's also the issue about public service values. Okay, what is it that makes working the public service different and distinguishable from working anywhere else, um, particularly in, in private sector organizations? Uh, and in some countries, like in Australia, they've gone so far as to legislate for public service values and to say, like, this is what it is to work in the public service. And this is just reminding or trying to restore people's faith in, in the public service. And it speaks to the whole agenda, again, of, of, of trust in public services and the trustworthiness of public servants. Um, this comes in the context of various corruption scandals as well, of course, in, in different countries. Um, so the issue of, of public, motiva public service motivation and public service values, because, of course, when you don't know what to do and you're in the midst of a crisis, when everything else is unclear, the strategies are out the window, you, you fall back on your values. So what exactly are the values of public servants that are guaranteed, that are cohesive, that provide a level playing field, or sorry, sort of provide a platform for, for good quality public services? So this is quite a, you know, it tends to be seen as a kind of amorphous issue, but actually fundamental uh, to everything that goes on in the public service. Okay, there's also, and this is sort of the final side of the issue of public service motivations, the, the changing nature of public service employment, because I'm sure most of you will be aware, the whole idea of being a public <coughs> service as being a very closed shop uh, is, is really changing everywhere. There's very few countries, and I know from my own experience in the Republic of Ireland, I mean, the crisis has just completely opened up the senior levels of the public service. There was some like single-digit figures in terms of um, senior-level positions being opened up from the mid 
early to mid 2000s. But now all senior public positions are up for public competition, whereas previously it was only, the only way up was through the bottom rungs, uh, as it were. Uh, but you can see in some countries have moved the, the, the general direction. Um, the point I'm getting to is to have more and more people coming in who aren't traditional public servants and coming into the public service. And this has consequences again for public service values, for you know the, the whole nature of working in the public service. It's no longer a career, it's a, it's a period of your career possibly. Um, the major movers um, have been, well I would have said Australia and New Zealand, but clearly in the Netherlands as well. And sorry, I can't, did I not circle it? Sorry, no I didn't circle it. Oh yeah, there's the United Kingdom there. Again, I, I, I'm not aware of the figures here for, for Northern Ireland, um, but I'd be delighted if anyone could send them to me or give them to me. Uh, but there's the, that's the trajectory of change, unlikely to reverse any time soon. Finally, I just want to say a few words uh, before I hand over to my, my colleagues, um, just about the issue of, of structural <laughs> uh, reorganisation. And this um, slightly simple chart, there's an awful lot of work uh, has gone in behind this. Um, I've, I've borrowed from a colleague um, at the University of Leuven and essentially what this chart is saying that over the last 25 years what you've seen is a move from the top left quadrant to the bottom right. What we're talking about here is moving from a very large um, undis undifferentiated and you might argue slightly inefficient public services um, down towards a situation at box number two where we, we're very fragmented, very um, uh, a lot of uh, you might in fact too much fragmented fragmentation, too much disjoint between different parts of the, the public service. Um, principally here we're talking about the whole agencies or quangos issue, um, that we see a general trend over the last 20 years of governments creating more and more standalone bodies. Now, these aren't all domestic, I mean some of these are inspired by European Union initiatives, particularly in respect of regulatory bodies, national regulatory agencies and so on. Um, but this has been the trend, okay? And very importantly behind this is this idea of, of separating, separating out the different tasks of government. So let's separate out policy development roles from policy implementation roles and so on. And this is all really, in the context of the crisis, really fundamentally being rethought that actually is the best thing to do in government to separate out the people who are implementing things and delivering things from the policy side, the people who are thinking about things. Perhaps we should actually integrate these more. Perhaps we should open up the public services more to people, as I think Kess is a good example of this, of course, of, of, to, to outside ideas. Okay? Um, and what we see at the moment is the move from two to three. And this is the, the reintegration of government. So agencies being merged together, government departments taking back in uh, various bodies, um, coming together of um, which, uh, rejoining up of the public policy cycle. And again, much more integration, much more emphasis on evaluation, much more emphasis on what works, what's delivering value for money, and feeding that back into the policy process. So um, the, I imagine the trend towards a sort of a smaller, perhaps more centralised, perhaps more politically controlled public service as well uh, is underway uh, at the moment uh, from the uh, rising from the crisis. I, sorry, I forgot I had this chart here. This, this is actually a survey of um, 21 countries, uh, mainly EU, though that includes Australia, I think Pakistan, don't ask me how or why, it's a long story, but I think that's in there as well. Um, and th there's two types here, there's, there's the traditional, uh, what you might call the executive agency in the, the UK context, the next steps agencies, and the sort of statutory, the, the full on statutory independent and non-departmental bodies as well. And the story here of this chart is just a huge boom since the 1990s uh, in these. A huge amount of these have been created around Europe. And what we see now is um, a contract. There's, there's very few of them being created, but as I say, they're, they're being closed down by large. And where I do have very good information and quite good knowledge as well is, is on the case in the Republic of Ireland. And this is a chart based on a project of, well, I suppose I'm still involved in over the last number of years. And this chart more or less says, well, how many public bodies have been in existence in the Republic of Ireland, including ministerial departments since 1922? And by and large, over time, you just see an increase. Now, bodies, this includes bodies that, that were created and were closed down as well. So it's in any given year, how many were there? And you see the trend over time. And you get to the 1990s, just as we see in other European countries, and it really rocket, rockets off. Now, of course, it kind of not mirrors sort of the boom in the economy and GDP and, you know, probably national happiness and all other things as well. There were similar charts like this. And you get to 2008 and almost for the first time in the state's history, there's an overall decrease. The public service is getting smaller, uh, in effect, for the, for the first time. So this raises all sorts of questions about, the, the so, you know, the political and social contract. You know, why do we pay taxes again? You know, government is getting smaller and I'm paying more taxes. What, what am I getting? Uh, what, what, what's going on here? Um, but there's a lot going on. But 
and this is my final or sorry penultimate graphic what's an equally interesting story is what's happening at the local level which will be uh, coming on to in the next presentation and this is just based on a couple of studies um, I did we did a big survey on corporate governance of local and regional bodies in the Republic of Ireland so all these agencies not local authorities but all these agencies that have been created uh, over time they're, they're all listed here a lot of them inspired now by EU funding it has to be said but in May 2007 I counted about 250 this time last year that have been cut by almost 20%, and the plans, quite actively underway at the moment, are to slash this even further. So dramatic reduction at the local level, and I imagine possibly something similar might be happening here, which raises all sorts of questions about workforce planning, integration, cohesion of services, um, thinking about new ways of service delivery, uh, and so on. Um, but it's quite a dramatic change, and a lot of these um, uh, have had huge consequences for the work of local authorities south of the border in terms they've had to take over many new um, ent uh, developmental roles that they didn't have previously. Okay, and my last slide, I hope I'm not running too much, is just uh, in terms of next steps. I mean, there's nothing too um, sophisticated about this. As I say, these are things I would like to do some, some work on rather than work things I am doing work on at the moment. But the evaluation, I mean, what is the effects of all of these reforms, you know? Uh, I mean, reform is a constant feature of government, um, but we need to think about the, the internal consequences of all these changes uh, for the way government does its business internally, its relationship with the public, relationship with stakeholders, businesses and so on. And what about this term that's trotted out a lot, the whole of government idea, the idea of joined up governments, which we, you know, is always very appealing, very saleable politically, but what does it actually mean in the context of ever decreasing resources and ever more pressures on, on government. You know, people always want more things, you know, um, from, from government. Um, the issue uh, around the generation and use of performance information, um, this has been, the, the use of it is a huge issue. The Obama administration has put enormous resources in, the, the, as in the second term of the president, the American Academy of Public Administration is a huge project underway about using, because the United States has been the sort of world leader of developing unbelievable amounts of data about government at all different levels and then they rise well what do we do with this what does it mean you know we know what's going on but what does it mean and and how can we understand it and how can we make things better so how to use performance information is a particular skill that I again I, I'm not quite sure the extent to which this occurs here in, in Northern Ireland accountability is being rethought again about how how we understand accountability the relationship between political and administrative accountability um, sorry regulatory reform the EU is playing a huge role here, uh, trying to think about new ways of getting people to do things without legislating for everything. Um, finally, the provision of policy advice. I've mentioned already the opening up of government to outside influences, such as universities, which are particularly well placed to, to help uh, government in, in tackling difficult social problems. And, and you know, getting information, uh, as I said on a couple of occasions, um, I, I don't know if I'm not looking in the right places, I find it quite difficult to find um, good quality information about the Northern Ireland Civil and Public Services. And um, so I'm, I'm not very familiar uh, with what's going on, uh, but maybe there's an issue there that needs to be looked at. I mean, the whole, uh, the whole idea here is about better transparency in government and sort of ex-ante accountability, putting the information out there in advance rather than everybody having to submit freedom of information requests and, and so on about what it is the public services do. Thank you.